Today, I want to start with a two body problem. You're probably familiar with this one from your undergraduate level class. And this would be a two body problem for objects interacting through uh, central force. So central forces are like gravitational forces, right? And if you look at the solar system, you have elliptic forces. Does anybody know why the forces are elliptic? Sorry, the trajectories are elliptic and not perfect circles, the orbit of the planets around the sun. Okay, is the only force from causing solution from one of our I'm not sure I follow your answer. So why is it not a perfect circle? Why did they turn elliptic? Sorry? For the electric. So if you had a circular orbit, does that make it the minimum? Is elliptical orbit better? That's what I'm asking, do you know? Does anybody know? You guys are not, like you guys haven't waited the two to see which one would be more efficient or why is it that elliptic is more prevalent? Energy, from some reasoning from energy. All right, so we'll get to that today, okay? Let's see if you change your mind. And the way that we're going to do this is that we're going to use it. So we're going to use a Lagrangian setting to figure out this problem, to set it up. And this is actually what the famous physicists did when they were presented with Lagrangian mechanics. So you probably remember that Newton was looking at the stars too, right? And the planets and everything, and even the people before him. But the first great applications of Lagrangian is to look at this uh, system. So we start with the Lagrangian, Lagrangian. And the Lagrangian is written in, in the center of mass. coordinate. So this is the big R. And we have the separation between the two objects, which is this vector R12. And uh, it would be this vector minus this vector. So if you have the position of the two, right? The two vector positions for the two objects that you're looking at, that will be the separation with them. And we have the star, the potential, which is gonna be arbitrary, but then you can put in whatever potential you want, as long as this potential uh, just depends on the distance between those two objects. So notice separation is a vector. The distance between the two objects is that this is just distance, right? So it's not a vector anymore. So if we look at those two, we have a Lagrangian. And our Lagrangian is mass one. This is the position the velocity of vector one, position one, object one. Then we have the kinetic energy of object two. And then the potential energy that depends on this distance. So now we don't want to work with R1 and R2. We want to work with this center of mass and separation coordinate system, right? So those would be our generalized coordinates. 
So in that case, we would have M1 plus M2. And one half, now we're gonna have a mu. And mu is the reduced mass. So this is called the reduced mass. And what you have is that mu is M1, M2 over M1 plus M2. All right, any questions so far? So we have a Lagrangian. It has two parts. One part is describing the motion of the center of mass, and the other part is describing the motion of uh, the separation. So, is the center of mass important then? In this Lagrangian? Michelle? Yeah. Why? Because now it represents the like how two bodies will move in terms of the Well, actually, no, right? Because there's no R by itself, big R. So this means that the R co big R coordinate is ignorable. And ignorable means that, what it means, right? That we just don't care about it. So we actually can talk about this part, how the center of mass is moving, but for the two body problem, this big center of mass is um, neglectable and we can just focus on the separation. Okay, does that make sense? That's why it's an ignorable quantity. So if we focus on the separation, and ignore the big R, uh, another thing that we can do is use Noether's theorem. And by using Noether's theorem, what do I get? So Samir, what is Noether's theorem gonna tell me here? Sorry? Well, I'm ignoring the big R, capital R. What else do I have there in this system? Is very similar. We already did it for the other problem. Using Sorry? Uh, should I use Lagrange's equation or Noether's equation? Well, just from Noether's theorem. Let's say this was a multiple choice question on a two minute, 30 seconds. You're at a, who wants to be a millionaire? And you're asked, what would Noether's theorem tell us about this Lagrangian? Who wants to be a physics millionaire? You only have 30 seconds. You don't have time to do math. But you see this Lagrangian. Well, ignore that part, right? So Noether's theorem is related to what? Conservation. What's conserved there? Exactly. And how do you know? Because uh, exactly. So we use Noether's theorem. Uh, 
And now we know that there's an angular momentum. And this is going to be a conserved quantity. And is related to this monster. So we have the momentum, and thus momentum is just the conjugate of this position. Yeah? Uh, in this case, we can only know the, uh, like the coordinate representing the motion of center of mass, that is capital R, right? Mm -hmm. Then how did we get this angular momentum? Like from Noltas theorem, we will get M1 plus M2 into R dot is a constant. So what you're doing is that there's a symmetry on the system. This potential gives you a symmetry, right? And that's the symmetry that is, so you see this symmetry math equation and you translate that and then you realize that that's this quantity. So we, we can tell the symmetry from the Lagrangian or? Uh -huh. Because of this guy. More uh -huh. So that symmetry is what will get translated. So now what we have is that this L, the angular momentum, because of the form of the equation is perpendicular to the position, to the separation vector, right? So L is perpendicular to R12. So that means that the orbit has to lie in a plane perpendicular to the angular momentum. So the angular momentum, we can set it up to be in the C axis if we wanted to. And then the R12, and the position of the two objects is in this x, y. And if we do that, we can use polar coordinates. And these polar coordinates are the R and phi, right? in that plane, and now we have a new Lagrangian, or we can rewrite our Lagrangian into being Yeah, so this, this is here. And there's our potential. All right, Nikita, what's the first thing you notice in this Lagrangian? Did you say like, okay, this is gonna make the problem easier, right? On phi, right? So phi is ignorable. Yeah, you have this R now. So these are your two coordinates now, right? Yeah. This one and this one are related. This one doesn't have the phi. And then again, you also have the R here. Yeah. So the phi is ignorable. And again, I can use another theorem, right? Because they say like, oh, look, there's another symmetry here. Or from this ignorable quantity, I use Noether's theorem again and can write that there's a conserved quantity, and this conserved quantity is now this guy, J. Well, we know in which direction J is. It's not actually a vector. And it's finally here.
So again, this one is the conservation of angular momentum too. So it doesn't give us something completely new. It just gives us the, another version of conservation of angular momentum. So the direction of L was already fixed to be in the C axis. So L is in the C axis. And then this guy is actually two in the C axis and it's just proportional to the other one, right? All right, so now that I have this Lagrangian and I have already analyzed this, yeah? Yeah, I think it's five dot, not five dot. Yep, you're right. Sorry. Yeah, those numbers just creep up when you're writing on the your notes. So once we have this Lagrangian right here, this is just the analysis for it. But with the Lagrangian, I can write the equations of motion for R and from Lagrange equation and that Lagrangian, I get the equations of motion. And this is, remember this guy. And that's just this part. It's equal to zero. So that's why I keep putting that two in the wrong place because I get confused between them. Questions? No? All right. So the next step would be, we have a P dot here and we have a phi dot here. So I can look at this equation right here and rewrite it with this conserved quantity. So this is, this is not where I stick my J's. It's down here where I stick my J's. And I stick the J in here and I can rewrite the equation of motion. And then I get a differential equation that is used in terms of R. So you would have this term and an effective potential. So, ouch. let me do that. I use the conserved quantity J to do some algebra. And I'm going to have an equation of motion that looks like this. where the effective potential is whatever the form of the potential I have, plus this J squared over two new R squared. Okay. So this is the whatever potential you were using. We could have used gravitational potential. We could have used whatever it is, as long as it's just a central force.
And it doesn't have to be like one over R, one over R squared, right? It could be whatever you wanted it to be, as long as he was just the central force. It could be alpha R to the beta, I don't know, something crazy like that. And what we see then is that we have a potential, effective potential is our potential that is generic at this point. And then we have this term that, that is uh, related to your angular momentum. And this J term right here is called the angular momentum derivative. Okay. Questions? All right, so then we have that term, we have that potential. Let's assume now that the two are interacting the two particles are interacting through gravity, okay? Gravitational interaction. So here is my effective potential going in that direction. Here is R, the distance between the two objects. This potential would look something like this. And then this axis is approaching zero. So I guess I have to say where the zero is. So there's a minimum somewhere here. This minimum is where I would get a circular orbit. Anywhere in between, like here, I would have an elliptical orbit. And then if I'm above the zero, like over here, this corresponds to hyperbolic orbits. So this looks a lot like what we were doing for the spherical pendulum, right? Last class, almost exactly the same. So what's next? We had the conserved quantity, Monsieur? We have this conserved quantity that is related to momentum. We also have another conserved quantity in the, in the Lagrangian, which is related to that. Oh, to what is it related? So we look back at the Lagrangian, right? Yeah, here we have a conserved quantity that is the momentum related to this guy. And then if you look at this Lagrangian, there's another conserved quantity. What is it? Just like this very cool pendulum, right? Yeah, what is it? You remember? Time. So there's no time dependence in our Lagrangian. So that means that we have the central force potential and we have kinetic energy 
and they should add up together, right? So energy is conserved and it's a constant and it's related to this guy. So this is a constant of the motion. Again, the energy, total energy of the system is conserved. Since that's a constant of the motion, um, we know where this is for the gravitational forces, but it's also for any, for any of the potentials that we wanted to do. And just like for that other problem, we can say that we solved it once we reduce it to a quadrature. For this general potential, we have a solution. And again, this solution is in not a real solution, right? Or do you guys want to have an analytical form, but actually something that we can stick into a computer or solve by hand by using calculators. And we have that this becomes the solution that we're looking for. And that this is not easy to solve Or the whatever you uh, whatever potential, the general potential. If we have that VR is the gravitational potential, then we would have that there's an M1, M2, the G constant, and R. You have the G is Newton's constant. You probably studied this one already in your mechanics undergraduate level class. And you can see that this is where Kepler's laws come about. And then you would be able to see things like this, where you have the hyperbolic orbits, you have the elliptic orbits. And you might have the circular orbit. So all of this is something that you already probably studied, but maybe didn't, they didn't put it in this framework. Because if I look at all of the undergraduate courses for mechanics like Marion and Thornton or whatever book you guys use, they do cover all of Kepler's law, but they don't study it with this, with this uh, schemes, but you guys have seen it already. So again, this is the reason that you get a circular orbit only when the energy is at its minimum, right? So that would be the minimum, but it's really hard to be in there. And based on the positions of your system, you almost always have elliptical orbits or your planets or the comets or the asteroids or objects visiting the solar system. So an object visiting the solar system would be like this hyperbolic orbit. All right, questions? Yeah. Well, you, you could have some perturbation from other planets, right? Mm -hmm. This is just considering the two body problem. Okay. But there's no friction in space. Yeah. So there's no drag that would take them towards that minimum in circular orbit. Yeah. Yep. So things to, that are nice about it, about the way that we did it, so we have two particles in X, Y, C, both of them. So that means that we have six degrees of freedom, right? Two times three. And then we reduce everything 
the six degrees of freedom from the positions by getting rid of the center of mass motion, we now have three degrees of freedom, the separation R12 vector. And then um, what else do we use? Uh, we use conservation of momentum to reduce it to two degrees of freedom, R and phi. And then we use this conservation of the magnitude of the angular momentum, the J is just the magnitude of it. So L is conserved both in direction and in magnitude. And J is just the magnitude of it, right? It's proportional to the magnitude of the angular momentum. So from the second use, we just reduce it to R. And then conservation of energy allows us to solve this problem because this is basically the equations of motion. Once you have whatever the potential and is thicker in there, now you have the equations of motion. So why did I spend so much time to show it this way? Because this I think is the perfect way to show how conservation laws Give what gives us all of the physics that you need to understand it, even this problem that is, maybe you have seen it before, but not at this level like this, like I was telling you, but then you get to see how the conservation laws are giving us all of the answers and making it easy for us to investigate these motions. 